This meeting is now being recorded. All right, thank you again um, for joining this webinar. This is the overview of the Spark Fund Round 3. My name is Stevie Valdez. We're going to go ahead and begin with just some webinar logistics. Um, all guests are going to be muted for this webinar to avoid uh, background noise. If you do have questions for the presenters, please place them into the chat box to your left, or there is a Q&A button at the top of the screen, and we will use those to facilitate questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, this call and uh, slide deck is going to be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube site and website. It usually takes about 24 to 36 hours for that recording to generate, so please be patient as we get this up online. In addition, if you hit the register button for this webinar, instead of just getting the call in details, uh, we do have your email address, so we will email you a PDF version of these slides. Just to uh, go over what we will be covering in this webinar, we will discuss the objectives of the SPARK Fund and how it fits into the Alliance's broader strategy to catalyze the market for clean cooking solutions. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the SPARK Fund application requirements and process. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll have our gender, uh, Director of Gender and Humanitarian Programming, Corinne Hart, really discuss in detail how SPARK is also leveraged to me, our gender uh, mission and objectives, but also uh, increase your the success of your social enterprise through some of the gender work that happens uh, in conjunction with Spark. And then we'll have Jason Spindler talk um, at the last part of the webinar about how to build out a quality business plan for your Spark proposal, um, and think about how to utilize Spark grant funding to build your organization and, and attract investment with the goal really being uh, leveraging the grant money for uh, long-term long sustainability of your company and attracting investment. Um, and then we'll, we'll try for a 15-minute Q&A, assuming we get everything going quite quickly here. Um, so just to, to briefly discuss how Spark fits into our long-term strategy at the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, some of you have probably already seen a version of this slide um, or um, in, in our roadmap for phase two or in our business plan for phase one. And it's something that really stands out as still core to our strategy at the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves. And this is the three-pronged approach to catalyzing the market for clean cooking. Um, if, Again, this webinar is for people who are not as familiar with the Spark Fund, so um, I hope this isn't too much of a repeat for everybody. But essentially, part of this three-pronged approach is strengthening supply, uh, enhancing de demand, and enabling markets through, um, through standards, testing, research, et cetera. Um, where Spark Fund really fits in on this is the strengthening supply. So we really focus on making sure that there are a strong supply of clean cook stoves, fuels, and cooking solutions um, for the sector as we continue to really race towards our, our goal of 100 million households adopting clean cooking solutions by 2020. So with that, we're really looking for um, a, a robust supply of solutions, which means and implies scale here. So where does Spark Fund fit into that whole strengthening supply strategy? Again, many of you might have seen the slide at various impact investing events or other events that we've been a part of. This really is just meant to layer on and help um, our partners understand where each funding uh, mechanism lies from startup to mature. So when we talk about supporting the supply of clean cooking solutions, we know that it takes time for businesses to go through these growth stages and that different types of funding are needed at each stage. So the Spark Fund is really designed to address this challenge right around the venture and growth stage where few impact investors are willing to provide money and technical assistance um, because the businesses either aren't, aren't big enough or there are some internal capacity challenges um, and the companies in, in many cases are still trying to build markets. So the Spark Fund is really targeted to address that, uh, that niche where venture and growth stage companies are really poised 
to reach the next level and, and grow. Um, it does this with what we call a smart grant. So the grant itself is designed to um, prepare and be almost like an early stage equity investment. At the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, we are not uh, able to make equity investments ourselves, but we're able to prepare companies for that in the future. So the way the fund is designed, it's, um, it's it funds specific growth initiatives in your business plan that would get you to the next level. It then is um, released in tranches and stages, and we really take a look at any capacity initiatives to fund along the way. And then Jason will talk a little bit more about what we look for in terms of leveraging the, the grant funding to seek on follow-on investment. Again, with the idea that we'll have a sustainable supply of clean cooking solutions and Spark Fund grantees wouldn't necessarily need to continue to get injections of grant funds post-grant, that they would really be able to um, move forward towards more traditional or commercial capital or one of our more um, soft uh, investment facilities such as the Working Capital Fund. So I'm going to pause there, and I just want um, our our gender uh, expert here, Corinne Hart, the director for gender at the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, to to give a, a couple minute background on how this not only fits into the supply strategy, but um, how gender plays a role in all of this and the Spark Fund's goals. Sure. Thanks, Stevie. Um, hi, everyone. This is Corinne Hart. I'm the Director of Gender and Humanitarian Programs at the Alliance. And I just wanted to um, say very briefly that for us at the Alliance, we integrate gender and women's empowerment um, into everything that we do, including our finance mechanisms like the Spark Fund. Um, we really believe that gender-informed business models are the models that are going to be most effective and easily able to scale within our sector because women are such an important part of the sector, and gender-informed approaches really reveal um, areas of opportunity and barriers that you may not see otherwise. And so one of the goals of really ensuring that there's a gender approach to any of the SPARC grantees is really to ensure that the model is the most effective possible, which will scale adoption, which is the overall goal of the alliance, as well as um, it will also strengthen the gender and empowerment impacts, which is the core part of the Alliance's mission. So that's why you see um, a, a strong focus on gender through all of our finance mechanisms, including the Spark Fund. Great, thanks. And we'll go into the next slide a little bit uh, more in depth on how this plays out into the selection process as well as the post-grant management. Um, I do want to touch on one more uh, point on the slide before we go on to the next, and that's uh, about the windows for Spark. Again, thinking about a pipeline of clean cooking solutions, um, we restructured Spark in the second round to allow for earlier stage companies to uh, try for funding at the one to three hundred thousand dollar range, and those that's our Spark venture window, and then the three to five hundred thousand dollar range, and that's our Spark growth window. So the expectations when you apply to the Spark Fund uh, at the venture window will be slightly different than our expectations on uh, your sales traction and robustness of business plan and, and um, ability to leverage investment at the Spark growth stage. So that's something that will remain the same. For those of you that are familiar with Spark 2, this Spark Fund is very similar. Um, we've only just made small tweaks based on uh, uh, lessons we are continuing to learn as we go forward with the Spark Fund, but it's essentially this same idea, same selection criteria, same windows, et cetera. So moving on to the application requirements for the Spark Fund. Again, we're working every year and learning from um, past competitions for, for Spark and Pilot Innovation Fund in terms of best ways to get the information that we need to make a, a quality decision, but at the same time trying to leverage the business plans that your social enterprises are already creating. Um, and Jason will talk a bit more about that later on in the webinar. So the application requirements are the following. The six-page executive summary of your of business plan, 
um, a comprehensive financial model. We do have an updated better than ever template this year. Um, we've done quite a bit of testing on it. And this year, uh, it will be able to be unlocked, uh, so to speak, so you don't have, it's not password protected and you can make changes as needed, but we d don't recommend that considering there might be some challenges with the model going, uh, if you make changes. Um, and then we'll have this application workbook similar to the Pilot Innovation Fund. Uh, this is already on the website. You can already begin filling this out. In fact, it's been there for about six weeks now. Um, but it's the general information form for the application organization, a growth strategy overview, um, gender best practices questionnaire, impact questionnaire, uh, technical questionnaire. All of that's on there, again, helping us make our decisions. But this also helps us as we get through the Spark Fund uh, due diligence process and post-grant management. So we're already sort of poised to begin that uh, as soon as we, we make funding decisions. Additionally, um, we're going to continue to make use of the investment platform that you've seen for the past year and a half when applying to these funds. But now there's a uh, added functionality of being able to create a business profile and um, uploading your full business plans. The advantage of doing this is not just to apply to the SPARK Fund so that the judges can see your business plans, but actually we are working uh, quite diligently to get everybody's information up to date on this um, and then working with investors to also create profiles on this platform. So once uh, you have an up-to-date profile um, and the, bit, the changes in your company, are such that you you meet an investor's initial investment requirements, uh, your profile would or your company's name would sort of pop up in an investor's search on this platform for companies that meet their investment requirements. So it's a bit of a, an investment matchmaking platform, and we're continuing to build it up um, with our initial impact investing partners. But that's the advantage of of using this this platform. Uh, then we'll have the CVs of key management, which is pretty standard, proof of legal incorporation, um, and up-to-date compliance with your tax requirements. And if you have them, audited financial statements for up to three years. So I've already had this question coming into the investment at cleancookstoves.org um, email address. Some people don't have audited three-year financial statements. That is 100% okay. It just really helps us in the due diligence process if you have them. So not required, but uh, great to have them if you're there. Um, note that everything in terms of the application requirements can be sort of done offline once it's downloaded, but you do need to upload it and fill out the very basic informational form on the, the investment.cleancookstoves.org website. Um, we've had a challenge with the Pilot Innovation Fund this past year where there are a couple people who have, who had done the entire application and then didn't fill out the online form, um, which causes challenges for us because the judges are assigned your applications through this online platform, all the scoring, all the written comments. Um, it really helps us organize and collate information and not lose it and process the fund in a, in a quick manner. So please, I encourage you to, to let us know if you're having trouble, but use the online platform to submit your application. Um, so also I want to note here that this webinar isn't going to go in depth on how any of these application requirements or documents. We're working in the next week um, and by January 6th, or sorry, January 7th, to upload 15-minute segments on parts of the business plan um, or the Spark Fund application process. So we'll upload segments on the impact questionnaire, technical questionnaire. We'll upload a segment on how to use the application workbook. Um, it's it got quite a few linked spreadsheets, so we'll uh, provide some clarity on that. And we'll upload a 15-minute uh, webinar segment on um, the BidX platform and how to use it and advantages of the BidX platform, our, our investment platform. So all of that, again, will be online on our website and YouTube page in short increments instead of sitting through a one-hour webinar by January 7th. Additionally, on January 7th, we will have a webinar um, provided by our colleagues at IDEV International um, to talk about the financial model 
Um, it will help you walk you through the template, but also discuss um, what we look for in the financials or how to think about your financials. Um, if you do not choose to use our template this year, there are specifications in the RFP on what we would look for in your financials if you don't use the template, and they'll go over that again in their webinar on January 7th. So we'll continue to provide information as you apply, um, and hopefully that will uh, make the application process that much easier for you. Uh, moving on. So this is a bit about the Spark Fund process, and what we want to emphasize here is that it doesn't end when we select the companies. And so to give you an idea of what to expect as you apply for the Spark Fund, and if you receive the Spark Fund, um, we have a bit of a diagram here where you see we, of course, have the initial application process where we require quite a bit of information, um, including the financials, uh, testing results for stoves, um, if you have them, um, they're required for the Spark growth application this year. Um, that's uh, in the RFP. You'll see a link to our stove testing requirements, which came out in March of 2014. So all of that um, is qu quite clear in the RFP. Um, so that's all of those things that we require as the initial application. And then we'll do uh, an, a review with impact investing professional, sector uh, expert, and uh, five additional reviewers, um, or up to five additional reviewers, reviewing even for the initial phase of the application in order to provide quality feedback to all applicants. We'll then shortlist um, up to 20 enterprises for the due diligence process. And the due diligence process um, is a combination of a desk review of everything you've submitted in the initial application and a site visit um, by our, our consultants and, and partners at IDEV International and Innovent. Um, again, this year we've worked to try to streamline the application process to easily feed into the due diligence process um, and to quickly go through that. Um, the site visits are usually uh, one to two business days, but if you have any questions about that, you can definitely uh, touch base with Jason at the end of this webinar. Um, we take a look at, at everything that you've already put into your application during this due diligence process. We try to understand what your growth initiatives are and if they truly make sense for, for the company going forward, if they're really well thought out. We take a look at internal capacity, um, financial management practices, gender mainstreaming practices, uh, et cetera. Um, we then take the results of the due diligence and we put it into an investment panel. And these are investors that we continue to um, try to get interested in the sector. Um, some of them are venture philanthropists. For those of you that are nonprofit social enterprises, we do have um, venture philanthropists on this panel as well, taking a look at the sector and uh, getting their interest in and in putting their philanthropy dollars into the sector or even soft loans. Um, so that they come together and provide a recommendation on funding. Uh, we'll look to fund six to eight enterprises this year. Um, and we'll, again, see, depending on where, uh, how many Spark Growth and Spark Venture uh, applications we receive and, and strong finalists we receive. We then go into a negotiation of milestones. So for those of you applying for $500,000, we don't expect to get that all up front. Um, it's it, it's a equity type grant. We take a look um, at what your growth initiatives are. We try to give you some money up front to implement them, but then we continue to disperse funds in two to three to four tranches, depending on the amount, um, over the course of 12 months, and you're expected to spend it down over the course of 12 months. Um, so you have to reach performance milestones as you continue to implement your growth initiatives for your enterprise. Um, and these continue to evolve, but they usually involve sales targets and targ targets of achievement and completion of your growth initiatives. And in many cases, they achieve, are achievement and reduction of cost of goods sold or similar types of metrics. Um, they're very much a hybrid between grant type performance metrics and equity type performance metrics. And of course, they're negotiated and agreed upon by the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves and the social enterprise that we would fund through the Spark Fund. And then the post-grant management, again, is very, we 
um, very mirrored towards equity investment. We ask the companies to check in regularly. Sometimes it's very much a 15 minutes, hi, how's it going, any troubles, no. Um, but it can be up to an hour where you are uh, telling us how you're going through your growth initiatives um, and asking the alliance anywhere we can connect you with an entity that can really help you move forward. It's really good in those calls to talk about challenges as they come up. And of course, we'll discuss that more in depth if, uh, if your enterprise is selected. But we have those regular check-in calls. There's quarterly reporting. In, a, in addition to that quarterly reporting on just basic uh, uh, progress, we look for financial statements. So you are expected to be able to submit an income statement, a balance sheet, and a cash flow every quarter. Um, and you are expected to, to submit basic social and environmental impact data on the, um, based on the IRIS metrics, et cetera. Um, and then going forward, um, we do look to invest in your capacity development as an enterprise, and this includes gender capacity development. Um, and so I'll pause here and maybe see if we can get Corinne to come back online again and just discuss a little bit about uh, gender questions within the initial application, due diligence, and then post -grant, uh, gender and post-grant management. Sure. Thanks, Stevie. Um, so just really quickly, since I'm sure for some people the concept of having gender integrated through the entire process may seem a little bit um, um, unclear as to what that will actually mean or what that actually entails for you as the enterprise. Um, in the gender questionnaire in the application, what that's really meant to do is to give us a baseline and a basic understanding of what your company is currently doing. It's not meant to be punitive or held against you. Um, it's really meant to just give us a clearer understanding of where you're at as a company. Um, so questions around how many women and men um, are employed um, in your in your operations, how what kinds of distributors you're using, and if if um, women are engaged in those practices, if you have a strategy to mainstream gender um, throughout your business model, et cetera, just to give us an understanding as we review your application as to where you are um, in terms of uh, advancement, of having a good understanding of how to do this kind of work with gender mainstreaming as well as what the potential is for your company um, to empower women through, uh, through your work as well as the potential to use a gender mainstreaming approach to help increase the effectiveness and impact of your company. In the gender due diligence phase, um, you're, it's similar to the, race, the, the basic um, regular due diligence that will be done in terms of consultants um, reviewing, doing a desk review of your documents and potentially a site visit. And the types of things that they're looking for in this phase, again, are not meant to be held against you necessarily, but to um, validate within your application um, within the gender mainstreaming questionnaire, as well as to identify opportunities and um, barriers that you may uh, may or may not have already identified yourself. So it could be um, hopefully a useful for all of the companies, regardless of whether or not you have to be engaged into being able to see where you might have um, some potential to do um, some, some better and stronger work around mainstreaming gender um, to ensure that women are being given equal um, opportunities within your operations and throughout your entire business model, as well as um, you are strengthening the impact you have on women and girls as much as possible through your work. Um, for the post-grant management phase, what we've done in the past is uh, assign actually a gender expert to each winner who has worked really um, specifically and carefully with the, with the uh, grantee um, to develop a gender action plan. And that has involved um, a variety of different types of approaches. So that could include something like helping you do a gendered marketing assessment so that you're understanding if your marketing strategy um, actually is reaching both wi women and men with messages that resonate with both um, genders. It could also include something like helping you do a gender value chain assessment to identify opportunities within your value chain as to where you might have a, um, uh, an opportunity that you're not implementing to ensure that women have equal opportunities to the work that you're doing or to um, strengthen your work with women distributors, producers, et cetera. So 
That is ongoing throughout the entire process of the grant. Those consultant, that extra, that extra support is covered um, by the Global Alliance, and the consultant um, goes on site, works with you on the ground, as well as provides support remotely throughout the process. At the end of that, after you've developed your gender action plan, we work with you to identify one or two of the interventions that have been identified in that process, and then you are potentially eligible for funding from the Alliance to implement one or two of those most promising interventions. So that could be something like revising your HR policies. It could be um, creating a finance mechanism for women em employees or women entrepreneurs to be able to start micro-businesses around distributing your stove, a wide variety of different things. And so you can potentially get funding to implement those, and then we help you evaluate whether or not that whole process of having gender support, developing an action plan, and implementing a few interventions actually helped increase your bottom line as a company and your effectiveness, as well as whether or not it had in, um, increased social impact for the women and men that you're working with. Um. Thank you, Corinne. That's incredibly helpful. So um, with that, uh, I think what I want to do next is move it on to Jason Spindler at iDev International to discuss um, a bit more about the, the, the meat of the proposal, which is uh, your growth initiatives going forward, thinking about what your growth initiatives for your social enterprise are going to be and how you can best use this grant money to leverage the next uh, – the next uh, pot of money, likely investment dollars, as your enterprise grows. I think what we've seen very much in the past for the Spark Fund uh, applications is that enterprises tend to choose their growth initiatives based on what they think the alliance wants to fund. And so Jason uh, will provide a bit of clarity on, on what to think about there and best ways to, to take a look at it going forward. So with that, I think, Jason, you're on the phone, so please go ahead and speak up and let me know um, if uh, you can hear us. Uh, yeah, Stevie, can, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, and we're on the Building a Quality Business Plan for Spark slide. Yep, okay, fantastic. Um, all right, everyone, uh, thanks for dialing in, and as I mentioned, IDEV International, um, we're, we're a management strategy and investment advisory firm. Uh, the Alliance uh, brought us in last year along with Enevent, who's our par partner organization um, based out of India, uh, to conduct due diligence and help them do some of the evaluation on the Spark Fund program. Um, so that was we actually spent time in the field with all of the Spark finalists last year. Um, and... Uh, did a, a, an evaluation of each of the businesses, really based on their business model. Um, our core focus at IDEV is, is doing investments and, and helping businesses grow and scale, but also helping SMEs and emerging markets raise the capital they need. Um, we work quite uh, quite a lot with global investment funds that impact investors and just general emerging market investors. Um, and, and one of the things that GACC has asked us to do um, both last year and then even more so this year, is really think about what, you know, if Spark is the final phase, if it's meant to be the final phase before businesses are fully investable, meaning they can go out and raise capital from, from the impact investing world or even just the traditional investing world, what are the few little things that, that kind of businesses that are emerging need to do to get themselves um, to that position? So it's that last chunk of funding, um, that last that last step on the on the scale uh, before a cook stove or a clean cooking business is is ready for 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 regular equity or debt uh, capital from from the traditional markets. Um, so with that in mind, we helped uh, the alliance develop the application evaluation process designed really to mimic the investment process. Now we're doing these investments um, with impact investors and emerging markets investors every day. So we looked at um, what those processes look like and how we could adapt um, the alliance's structure around that. Um, so, again, the core application materials are based on what investors will require from you um, as you go to that, that next level and start to look for investor capital. Some of you might already be doing that, 
um, and you'll notice that, that the materials were designed to not have, the core of the materials were designed to not require you redoing everything just for the Spark application. Um, so the, the, a bullet in the middle of the, of the slide says, don't customize your materials for Spark. Um, again, the executive summary is really an executive summary business plan. It's a five to six page business plan. Um, the, just the core components of your business, the thing that if, if you were to drop that in front of an investor, in front of uh, a partner, in front of, you know, anyone that you need to explain your business to, that document should serve. We've provided a template, but if you have one that you think tells your business well, that you've spent a lot of time on, you can use that also. Same thing with the financial model. Um, the financial model was developed around what investors will be wanting, as well as what you should have for your businesses to, to really be able to do your financial projections going forward. Um, and then finally, the, the growth strategy template, uh, the growth strategy framework that's included in there. To me, this is one of the most valuable components of, of, of the application materials. Um, I would really look at it not as something required for an application, but really as a tool that you should use not only for Spark and not only this year, but for every year going forward. We within IDEV use it on an annual basis to do our short-term um, planning, um, and we have actually used it with clients to help them plan their growth strategy. So again, all of the core materials that are, that are part of the, the, the application packet Really look at them not only just for Spark and the Spark application, but for valuable tools and a valuable toolkit that you can use to, to one, present your business to investors and start building your investment materials, but two, also to help manage you grow and scale your business going forward. Um, anything that you don't feel is useful, let's say the, the financial model template, if you've spent a lot of time and maybe hired external consultants or done it internally and have a very robust financial model that tells your story well, you can go ahead and use that. Um, but make sure that it has all of the key elements required in, in, in this financial model template. Um, again, the, the moving beyond the application materials, the due diligence process. Um, so the evaluation and due diligence process. There's a green light screening process where we're evaluating all of the, the applications that come in. Um, we'll be looking at all of those application materials very much in the way that, that an investment process would, a green light investment process would. Every single applicant will get feedback, um, detailed feedback on their applications um, for, via a SWOT analysis that, we're, that we've put together um, for each of the applications. Those are ones who are selected for, to move on to the finalists as well as ones that, that aren't selected. We thought, and, and the Alliance thought it would be very helpful for all applicants to understand what worked, what didn't work within their application, and where they can strengthen either their application themselves or their, their strategy going forward, where there were questions and concerns. Um, moving beyond the, the initial screening process to, to the, due, the full due diligence process, once finalists are selected, the, the 20 or so finalists are selected, um, IDEV and N Event will have members of our team um, of our team in field. That means we'll be visiting each of the 20 finalists for a couple of days um, on top of the desk review that we'll do of all your materials, calls with stakeholders. Um, as part of that in field process, we'll look at your, your how you manage your accounting, how you manage your processes and systems. We'll walk your plant floor if there is a plant floor. We'll talk to key stakeholders within your value chain um, and even go out and do some customer-focused focused interviews. Um, and again, this process is set up to be similar to a traditional due diligence process. This is what we do when we get hired by investment funds to go out and conduct due diligence for them. Moving on to the next slide. We're there, Jason. All right. So. Uh, Beyond the evaluation criteria, um, this is really what are we going to be looking for and the alliance looking for as we're doing the, the evaluations of each of these applications. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, what is the, there's a full list of investment criteria that's included in the RFP um, as well as an investment criteria checklist that will be added to the materials that are posted online. Um, 
But really, again, it's looking at it with an investment lens. That's part of, of GACC's goal with the, uh, the, smart, the smart grant, um, it is looking at these investments with, looking at these uh, applications with an investment lens. What does that include? Um, that really, the main focus is your ability to grow and scale your organization successfully and be a viable commercial entity. Um, meaning, even if you're not profitable today, which is fine, um, having a realistic, achievable plan for profitability and commercial viability in, in the medium term. Um, so what are we going to really be looking at? We're going to be looking at your historical track record. What, what have you done to date? What are your sales and financials look like? Um, what do your customer feedback look like? Um, what have you achieved with your, with, your, with your business so far? And that really demonstrates ability to execute, which is the second point. Um, you know, we're going to be looking quite a bit at management's capabilities, the team you've put together, um, and your ability to execute on a plan um, successfully. Next is actually having a clear and achievable growth plan. So as we're looking at this plan, is it something that we think is realistic? Does it meet, meet with what we've seen in due diligence, so the customer interviews that we've done, the reviews of the factory or of your, your distribution partners, et cetera? Um, and is it something that, that one, is, is clear, focused in the right direction, and, and achievable? And obviously, we'll learn a lot about that from conversations with you, both prior to the infield due diligence and during due diligence. Um, so none of this is done in a vacuum. It's all done with, with lots of questioning and back and forth with, with each of the applicants in the, in the final phase. Um, we'll be looking at financials. And, and again, it's important to note that reasonable and achievable financials are important. Pie in the sky, I'm going to grow my business to $100 million in the next three years, or, or, or you know, you see a lot of those. Um, it's better to have real, realistic, achievable financials and, and justify that in your explanation of your financials than try and have some, some you know, pie in the sky growth that shows an incredible impact of 50 million people and revenues that are growing exponentially. Um, and then, so then I've already mentioned that we'll go out and do the market knowledge. Uh, we'll be analyzing your market knowledge, customer, current customer insight, and competitive threats. That's really we're looking to see, is your product or your service right for the market? How well do you know your market? Um, how well do you know your customers? What do your customers say about your product and, or service to date? Um, and what are the competitive threats that you'll face going forward? And that's all, again, plays into your growth strategy. And finally, and, and, and we'll be looking at impact, both current and future impact. Um, and impact, as you all know better than, better than we do, impact comes in multiple forms. It comes in, in positive economic contributions. It comes in health contributions, environmental contributions, and as Corinne already mentioned, in, in gender best practices. Um, so that's really what we're going to be looking at in, in a nutshell. Uh, I'll pause there and, and hand it back over to Stevie. Um, thank you, Jason. That was incredibly helpful. Um, I don't see any questions yet. I've put a, a note in the chat box. Go ahead and start um, putting your questions in the chat box to the left or up on the top with the Q&A button. Um, with that, maybe I'll just add a couple of quick comments on the end of your discussion of the evaluation criteria. And um, Get just clarify in terms of the, the timeline and thinking about um, what your growth initiatives that you want funded by the Spark Fund are. Um, so keep in mind whatever amount of money you propose uh, to, in terms of the Spark Vendor or the Spark Growth Window, that money will need to be spent down in one year, although we'll be interacting with you as an entity for two years to see the long-term impact of the growth initiatives on your business. So that's a, a, a two-year grant process, but really one year to spend down and think through the funds. So think that through um, as you're trying to decide whether or not you're a venture or growth stage company. Um, there, there still is the growth stage questionnaire online if, uh, that was up last year. If you're interested in that, that's something to help you think about what stage company you are. Um, and in terms of the growth initiatives, do not be afraid to put in items like uh, marketing as part of your growth plan or implementing a new management information system as part of your growth plan. Or maybe it's a complete financial overhaul in terms of how um, your financial checks are in place and all of your 
field offices um, in it because you're now expanding to many countries, et cetera, uh, or new country expansion. Um, make sure it makes sense for your company, but don't necessarily be afraid to put in some of those more capacity building initiatives or cost reduction initiatives uh, as part of your plan because I, we see those as all filling into the long-term sustainability of your company. Um, and I would just add there, I would, yeah. I would just add there really quickly, Stevie, as well. Those are all things that we will see. If, if it's not in there, when we're doing the due diligence or evaluating the business plans, um, and in particular due diligence, those are all things that we will see um, when we're out in the field with you. So, so if we see it and we notice that it's a weakness or something that you'll need to do to grow, but you have it in your plan um, and as part of the uses, that only goes to strengthen your plan. Um, but if you see it, it's not there, then, then, then that'll raise concerns. Yes, um, although I will note uh, in the past round of Spark Fund, what we've done with some finalists is say, okay, that's a bit of a concern. We still want to fund you, but we want to take some of this budget and really address that concern going forward. Um, so now we actually have some questions coming into the Q&A. Um, the first one comes from uh, Neil Bellafield. Bell Neil, I apologize if I'm butchering your last name. Um, He's asking, what are your key dates for selecting the 20 finalists and then the final awards? That's a great question, Neil, and it's something we were going to bring up at the end of the webinar. So the RFP states, I believe, a, a March 1st um, date for the initial finalists. We, it looks like we actually might need to push that back a couple of weeks to mid-March. So those 20 finalists should know by mid-March, and then you'll be in the throes of the desk uh, due diligence and planning the site visits if you are a finalist. The final awards will still have that uh, end of May, 1st of June announcement date. Um, so that's what we're looking at. So when we say end of May, beginning of June announcement date, just note that we still have that negotiation of milestones to go through before the first disbursement comes on board. So think that through in your cash planning um, purposes, and, and that timeline is also uh, the same on, on the RFP. So the only difference is the announcement of the finalists uh, on, in mid-March and um, instead of beginning of March, but the rest of the timeline outlined in the RFP is the same. Um, and then just as a reminder, the full application is due January 30th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, I've got another question coming into the chat box, and I'm just going to go with the first name, Joseph. Uh, what is the slot for, for Spark Fund for Kenyans? Uh, that's a great question. So the Spark Fund is a global fund. Um, we don't necessarily have a slot for particular countries. Um, we don't have any number of awards reserved for any one of our focus countries, for example, because of the nature of the global fund. Um, what we do, what we do state in the RFP and, and how this comes into play for Kenya and our other focus countries in the future is um, when we are trying to decide between applications that are sort of of equal merit or um, a really equal scoring, and we, we can't really decide whether or not to put one or the other forward, we will choose a focus country application if it is a focus country uh, ahead of the other one. So that's, that's where the focus country comes into play. Again, this is a global fund. We've uh, funded um, Sparks in, in Cambodia, for example, and that's definitely not a focus country at this time. So it's you're, you're eligible from all countries, but uh, we definitely encourage our focus countries to apply. And we do have smaller funds that are only for our focus countries. Um, if you go back to the original, um, the our graphic slide, and maybe I can just jump back to that quickly. If you're interested in a fund specific to a country, that's the Catalytic Small Grants Program, which rolls out in countries. So going back to questions now, it looks like something else has come through this Q&A poll. Um, an online business proposal under documents, is it required to upload business proposal and financial plan? Is this financial plan different from the financial model or are they the same thing? So I'm going to go ahead and answer this and Jason, if you want to put any clarity on this, let me know. Um, under documents, the, the business proposal, um, there, there are a couple of different 
things to keep in mind. There's your five to six page executive summary that is that really helps us understand in, in a nutshell what your business plan is going forward. So that is a document. And then there is a your bid X or your investment platform profile. Um, so your invest, investment platform profile includes uh, uploading of a business plan online. And when you go to put the form, um, fill out the Spark application form, it'll ask you if you want to include a business profile and you would include your business profile, which includes more of a business plan and detailed information about your organization. Um, your business profile must be 100% complete as you go to apply for the Spark Fund. Again, we'll have a 15-minute webinar segment uploaded by January 7th, really going through that in depth. But if you are interested in talking um, about that more in depth, then please go ahead and email investment at cleancookstove.org. In terms of the financial plan, the, there is a financial model, um, which is a separate document. Um, but it, the financial plan um, and the financial model are all based um, in, in the same in the same thing. They're, I don't think they're two separate things. You will have a budget which is separate. Um, Jason, I don't know if you have any clarity on that um, or thoughts on that. Um, okay. Go ahead. Hello. I'm not sure what's what's being referred to as the financial plan, but there's the, the yeah. there's the growth strategy plan and the financial model. Um, the financial model is just you know it's a, it's a standard financial model that has been developed and, and used um, across many businesses already. Um, it, it's a pretty it, it's a pretty wide open plug and play model um, that that's you know your profit and loss page, uh, so your income statement, your balance sheet, and your cash flow statement. Um, and, and we've set it up in a way that will help you to auto-generate those, um, as well as as well as an output page that should be copied and pasted into the bottom section, the final section, I believe, of the executive summary. It's just a, a, a summary table, a summary chart from the financial model as well. Um, so the executive summary does have a very small portion on it in its section that is talking about your financials. Um, and you paste in a financial summary ta um, um, chart as well. If you're using your own model, please uh, make sure that you do include a financial summary in your executive summary as well. Um, and it's important to note, please make sure that you do give um, description definitions. So tell us about your assumptions of the model. What are your key drivers? What are things that, that we could have questions on? That will really help us understand what's driving your model. And, and if we have a question about you know, why revenues change so much in one year, why costs change so much in one year. It's helpful to have, well, we're investing in, in CapEx and are going to install a new facility that'll increase expenses but drive revenue a year from now, kind of, kind of notes. Thanks, Jason. We're getting a couple more questions here. Um, this next one in the chat from Selma. She said, uh, she said, we tried to register to become a member of the GACC, but the link from the RFP is not working. The page that comes up that says file not found, is there another way to register? So um, I, I don't have the screen share capability uploaded right now for this webinar, but if you go to the cleancookstoves.org website, um, I believe it's on the top right-hand corner, you can click Partner. And then um, there's the option to become a partner. Um, I think it's partner login on the top right. And then you can click become a partner and it goes from there. I think there were some changes to our website right when we were releasing that RFP. So thanks for pointing that out. We'll go ahead and uh, try to fix it and upload a revised RFP with a link that's working. But for those of you who are trying to register as a partner, please go to cleancookstove.org. Uh, click on Partner Login, and then click on Become a Partner. Uh, if you still have challenges with that, please do let us know. Any challenges with the application process can be emailed to investment at cleancookstove.org. Thank you, Jason, um, for putting that link in the Spark chat. Um, I do have another question here um, from Saname. It's, is the Spark Fund working with carbon markets? Um, I'm not quite sure, Saname, exactly what you're meaning, um, but go ahead and I'm going to try to answer, and if you have a follow-up question, let me know. So if your organization receives carbon revenue as one of your revenue streams, 
um, that is absolutely something we want to know about within your Spark Fund application proposal. Um, everybody looks at carbon a little bit differently. Um, so again, going back to Jason's point about putting your assumptions into your financial model, please let us know how you're thinking about and how you're booking carbon as revenue. Um, and it's something that is that we definitely take into consideration as a revenue stream that um, is 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 key to some of the, some of the business models that are out there. Um, I will note that due to some of the fluctuations in the carbon market, it's really good if you point out risks and mitigants for changes to the carbon market as you continue to apply. If you're asking more about the Global Alliance's work with carbon markets overall as part of our strengthening supply strategy, um, my colleague Jen Swidal at the Alliance is working quite diligently with, um, with on the carbon markets, continuing to increase demand and, um, and work with carbon project developers and, and others um, on strengthening the, the supply of, of credits um, and, and demand for credits and carbon credits going forward. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, and I think we actually have time for one or two more questions, um, so I'll wait very quickly. Okay, uh, the next question that comes in, what about companies that have previously received funding from the Global Alliance already? So this, um, this is a very good question from Judith. Um, so the companies that have already received funding from the Global Alliance can be considered for funding from the Spark Fund going forward. Um, and the, the reason for that, again, is this the strategy to support companies throughout their growth stages. So we, we know that companies may be coming in at a Spark Venture, um, and one round, maybe two rounds later, might need to come back for a Spark Growth Fund. So that is possible. Um, for current grantees, we've had conversations already with most of them, um, particularly current grantees of Spark Fund Round 2, for example. Many of those grantees are already, uh, are still quite implementing their growth initiatives. They're still receiving, trying to meet milestones and receive all of their committed funds from the Alliance. So those grantees would would not be eligible, um, Spark Fund Round 2 grantees would not be eligible for Round 3, just because they're still not, we, we haven't seen the full traction and the full implementation of their growth plans going forward, um, and, and we don't want to necessarily layer another Spark grant on top of that. Um, with that being said, if a Spark 2 Venture Round grantee came back for a Spark 4 Growth Round funding um, and then was able to move on to impact investment after that, um, that is something that could happen. So for this, for this SPARC, for example, SPARC 1 grantees could come back for funding. With that said, um, we really do look closely at whether or not our grant fund will be catalytic for the company to become sustainable and leverage investment or not. So we don't want to replace investment dollars if we do believe that a company can get um, this capital from the commercial sector um, and the investment sector. So we, we do look at that very closely, and um, if, if somebody has received a SPARC grant or even a pilot innovation fund grant in the past and they come back for a SPARC fund, and we, we really do think that the company can secure the capital outside of the alliance, we uh, would not select them for the SPARC fund because it would not be catalytic uh, for the company going forward, and we want to make sure that we really ease the transition from grant, and grant dollars to investment dollars. Stevie, let me let me add in one point here. I think that's great. There was a sure. question. Um, there was a question from Mozambique, um, and I think it kind of fits into to both sides. You know, last year we did have some organizations that applied for Spark that that um, you know, thankfully, uh, uh, unfortunately for them, they weren't able to to get Spark the Spark funding. But but it was for good reason. They were they were too large and strong and far enough along the curve that they they could access impact investing or other investment capital. Um, so that's important to note. If, if you are, are one of the businesses that, and organizations out there that can get capital from the impact investing world from more traditional sources, um, then there's a chance that, that you're outside of the SPARC um, 
framework. On the other end um, of the spectrum, and, and to get to the question from Mozambique, um, if you're an NGO or a nonprofit, and, and Stevie, correct me if you uh, jump in here if you if you have any other comments, but if you're an NGO and nonprofit and are looking to shift your model to a for-profit model um, and, and have a plan in place to do that that's a reasonable, feasible, viable plan, then 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 uh, I think that is highly off applicable for Spark. Um, if you can already show a track record of revenues, et cetera. Um, but if you're an NGO that's just going to continue to, to, to operate as a nonprofit, then it's probably not the best fit given that, that commercial viability is a key focal point of Spark. And maybe I can just clarify the language on that a, a little bit. I, I wouldn't say yep. the legal status itself would exclude you, so you can continue to be, um, quote, unquote, a nonprofit. Nonprofits can seek outside debt funding, for example. Um, I think it's more to this point, Jason, that you really mentioned. It's a great point um, coming out of Mozambique that um, you, you need to be really sustainable and scalable. And, and when we say sustain, sustainable, that um, – you're able to actually generate enough cash to continue to expand and grow as an entity going forward. Some of our nonprofits have developed uh, for-profit uh, arms, so they're hybrid structures, uh, or have remained nonprofit but really have an, an aim to sustainability. And is assuming that that is really strong uh, going forward or that's something that you're working to achieve, then I think that's something that we would take into consideration. Um, I just don't want to get hung up on the legal structure itself. Um, Thanks for adding I, We're getting – yeah, no worries. Um, I think we're we're getting past time, so I'm going to ask answer these last few questions coming in. If you do need to drop off the call, we completely understand and we thank you for your attendance. We will provide the full recording um, on, online again in 24 to 36 hours, and then we'll send slides to those of you who have registered. So, um, getting on to Nicholas uh, uh, Nicholas's question here, um, could I, I'm assuming that this is asking whether or not you could use Spark to uh, achieve or fulfill a carbon credit contract. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure what we mean about fulfill a, a carbon credit contract, but if you are looking to register a POA um, or become part of a CPA as part of your growth initiatives, um, if, if carbon is part of your growth initiatives, I think that's something you can definitely put into your Spark Fund application. I would go back to my earlier point about risks and mitigants. Is this going to be something that is uh, crucial to your company scaling going forward? And if so, how will you uh, mitigate the risk of uh, fluctuations in the carbon market for your enterprise? So that's something to, to, to keep in mind. Um, Going on, uh, I have a question here. Will you announce the Pilot Innovation Fund awardee, awardee prior to closing of Spark Fund? The question is coming from Gregory. So that uh, the answer is yes, Gregory. So we are a couple weeks delayed on the announcing the finalists itself. Um, so a finalist will be announced very soon, any day now, and then the final decisions on who will be awarded are still planned to be announced January 15th. Um, we are very much on track to make that happen. So that's the January 15th closing. Uh, people will have received feedbacks from their or feedback from their Pilot Innovation Fund application um, by that date. And then with the Spark Fund closing on January 30th, you sort of have 15 business days between when Pilot is announced and when Spark closes. Um, and then one other question coming in here. Can Spark be used to enable partnerships with microfinance institutions to pay for cook stoves and installments? And that's coming from Sophie. Um, that's a great question, Sophie. And if that's part of your, your key growth initiatives for your company going forward, um, if then that's absolutely something you can propose. Financial inclusion has been growth in, part of uh, some of our enterprises' growth initiatives implemented through the Spark Fund. Um, we just ask that you think through that partnership quite uh, quite in depth and um, and make sure that that's really put into your cash flows as you continue to put your projections forward because that will affect your enterprise's um, 
uh, cash flows as you're getting payments and installments. Um, and then again, risk the mitigates for the partnership with, um, with MFI. So with that, I think that's the last question that's come in so far, and I do want to close out the call to respect your time. I do have a quick uh, set of final thank you, uh, thank you notes and, and, and final reminders. So if you do have any additional questions, go ahead and send them to investment at cleancookstoves.org. We are doing our best to be open and transparent about the questions and answers that come through. We are not able to have individual meetings with your enterprise to discuss your growth initiatives and ways to apply for the SPARC Fund. So we, we do our best to make sure that the questions that come in are not made anonymous and then put onto the Frequently Asked Question page, which is available at this link. Just as a reminder, you are required to complete 100% of your business profile on the investment platform, um, including uploading your business plan. Um, there is an option when you start to fill out your Spark Fund uh, form. It's just that basic informational form. Um, when you go to upload your documents, there will be an option to submit your business profile. Please select your business profile um, to su uh, submit it. The next webinar on Spark will be on creating your financial projections, again, what to think about and how to use the model that's been provided. That'll be January 7th, 2015 at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time, 1.30 p.m. GMT, the same time. Um, I believe Jason will be joining us again along with his uh, colleague Patrick Watson from IDEV International, who is really at the heart of creating the new financial model template. Um, in addition, those 15-minute segments that I mentioned on the application workbook and platform will be up on the YouTube site and our website by January 7th, 2015, again at the same time. The 15-minute segments that we have planned so far are um, using the, the investment platform, on um, using the application workbook, that's the Excel workbook document that's provided in the templates. Um, and the the last one will be on the impact questionnaire and the test or sorry the technology questionnaire that's within that workbook, and that will be done by my colleague uh, Rainy Chahane, who is our director of, um, of of technical work here at the Alliance. Those 15 minute segments again will be up on the website recorded. They're not live webinars; they're just help um, there to help you out. Um, again, Spark Fund closes January 30th. We really do look forward to all of your quality uh, business plans and applications. Um, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and close the webinar unless, Corinne or Jason, you have any final points that I might be leaving out. Nothing on my end. Well, then. So much. I really do want to thank our presenters, Corinne Hart and, and Jason Spindler. Uh, thank you for your time in providing clarity on the Spark Fund process. Uh, thank you to all of you who have joined and have asked these questions. They're incredibly valuable. And again, this is not the end of the conversation. We look forward to continued questions from your end. Uh, best of luck as you prepare your applications. Thank you.